Welcome everyone to Shefa's Community Conversation. This morning I'm speaking with Lauren Taus, and we'll start um, in just a moment by reading Lauren's bio and getting to know a bit more about Lauren. We're also welcoming uh, individuals, community members to this conversation who are here and listening to uh, Lauren and I speak, but then opening up the conversation uh, for more dialogue and more reflection. So thank you all for being here and to all of our listeners uh, who are listening to the recording. My name is Rabbi Zach Kamenetz. I'm the founder and CEO of Shefa, a Jewish organization dedicated to psychedelic support in the Jewish community. And our mission is to provide powerful pathways to the heart of Jewish wisdom, practice, and community inspired by the psychedelic renaissance. And in this way, we're hoping to re-enchant spiritual life broadly uh, through this work where psychedelic states and religious and spiritual traditions can mutually reinforce and re-energize each other. So thank you for being here. I'd like to introduce our guest, Lauren Taus. Lauren is a psychedelic assisted therapist trained to work with both psychoactive compounds and plant medicines. Lauren leads Embodied Life, a group therapy practice that also offers immersive educational programs for clinicians to learn psychedelic assisted therapy and integration in contexts that hold personal healing as essential to effective facilitation. Lauren is a lifelong student, educator, and activist. For decades, Lauren's work has focused on creating aligned and kind mind-body connections to support complete health for individuals and the collective. Lauren is a regular speaker and contributor in the larger space of psychedelic medicine. Her work has been featured in Double Blind, Chakruna, The Guardian, New York Magazine, and more. Let's not forget Lauren's amazing Instagram page, all of the work that she does on social. I highly recommend that you follow that immediately. And I want to welcome you, Lauren. Thank you for being here. Oh, Zach, I'm so excited to be here with you and with all of you, <laughs> those of you on video. It's really nice to see your faces. Uh, some of you I know, and it's it's uh, an honor to be here. This this uh, intersection of spirituality and psychoactive experiencing is really, really the, at, at the heart of, of who I be at this point in my life. And, and I'm really grateful to to share. Mm. Well, Lauren, you are now the second psychedelic assisted therapist, or at least person who's been working in this world um, as uh, as a guest. And I would love to get started by talking about before your your psychedelic assisted therapy practice to talk about your Jewish life, where you come from, who your people are, and where you are in your Jewish journey currently. So why don't you give us a little bit of, of that? Mm -hmm. Well, this is sort of like a coming out conversation for me in some ways. And, and Zach, we've had quiet conversations on the side where I've shared about my, my Jewish story and where it's been uh, a beautiful challenge. And, and I think that so much of Judaism is a beautiful challenge. Mm -hmm. And I am the, the daughter of, of, a, of a Jew, a Jewish man, and, a, and, the, and the daughter of a woman who's not Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I was raised Jewish, I was converted as a child. And Judaism was my, my context, my, my, my being. Uh, it was in the way of, of reform Judaism, uh, a little conservative mix in there. And, and as a kid growing up with a Jewish infrastructure, it also lacked meaning. And, and it didn't really land and resonate in a way that, that made any sense to me at all as a child uh, and even as a young adult. So that, that's, that's the kind of real back, back story. And, you know, and I, I wanna say too that my mother was a very spiritual woman. She passed away eight years ago. And she understood God as much bigger than any story of him, her, it, they, them. And in my more uh, personal understanding of Judaism now, when, when we speak of one God, it's, it's a God that, that to me can be prayed to by many different names. Hmm. And, and much of Jewish wisdom as I practice it now, and I do practice it now, uh, is, is uh, inclusive and is welcoming and is warm and it has so much light. I'm like floored. I'm in awe. <laughs> Get me in there. I want to learn everything. Mm. Uh, and, and it's meant to be learned in, in more uh, community. It's meant to be practiced in community. And, and that that's part of the beautiful challenge, I think. 
Uh, I, I also, as a, a young person, didn't believe really in God. Uh, I just didn't have it. It didn't make sense in any in any real way. Uh, so I, I ended up a religious studies major at Columbia, not because I wanted to study religion. I didn't, but I couldn't get myself out of the religion department. And what was happening for me then was a, a thirst and a hunger for something, anything bigger than me. Mm-hmm. And, and I, as a young person at Columbia, I really wanted to follow in the footsteps of my Jewish grandmother, who was one of the first women to graduate with a PhD from the economics department at Columbia University. And, mm-hmm. and I really wanted to do that. Like I thought I needed to have a high powered, high paying job in a big building, wear high heels and, you know, clear big checks all the time. And my spirit had a different agenda that I had the willingness to follow, although begr- begrudgingly at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh-huh. Uh, it's uh, just the, uh, yeah I love all the turning all of the all of the points of light here just so powerful so I want to just maybe just what you're describing feels like the the short long way right all all of the everything the flow of your life um which I'm always so inspired to hear more like there are even pieces in there that we haven't gotten to in our one-on-one conversations oh. <laughs> one of just maybe focus on the fact that uh, you know, your Jewishness from your father's side, not because of your father necessarily, but there's some like anemic quality that you just could not connect with. And yet your mother, bringing her in, may her memory be for a blessing, um, but there's something about her spirit and her background that filled you up with some sort of God consciousness, even if it was not so present until it had, was activated later, and also the memory of and the spirit and life of your Jewish grandmother. So we'd love to maybe just hear like the women in your life, all of this kind of like spiritual brilliant soup, and how did it kind of spill out into you kind of standing more firm in your Jewishness where maybe that had not been the case before that? Hmm. I mean, it get it starts to get psychedelic then, Zach. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> I mean, I, I I will say too that uh, you know my my longest term relationship was with a man who presenced to me that in certain communities I wouldn't count as a Jew, and and that was uh, an excruciating experience to me because of your patrilineal descent. And that and that the conversion wasn't um, machmir enough. It wasn't like dafka black hat enough. It wasn't, mm-hmm. it wasn't a thing, right? And, and so I was in, in this relationship, which was an, a perfect match for my internal experience of, of feeling inadequate, which is also like, mm-hmm. you know, stuff with belonging that I think is so Jewish, right? Like to, do we belong? Where do we belong? Mm-hmm. And, and in this key relationship, and we'll come back to the women, I, I heard the question. Okay. But so, um, okay. but I just want to name that it was through that relationship that I really started to study Judaism. Mm. And, I, and I was in uh, gear processes, like conversion processes within Orthodox communities. And what I discovered was that I was absolutely in love with Jewish wisdom. And that what I studied made like sense to me and landed in my, in my being in a way that I, I, I wanted more. And simultaneously, I wrestled with what was being asked of me from a lifestyle perspective, and, and also in the context of, of like a, a not so healthy uh, interpersonal connection. And, and you know, ultimately, like the, the rabbis were ready to dip me in the mikvah, and, and it didn't feel authentic or integrous for me to, to move forward. And so I, I wasn't willing to just do a thing for the heksher, for, for like the kosher stamp. And, uh, and, and that was also painful because I so desperately wanted to like fit in. And, and, and I just, in my kind of spiritual life, knew that like that wasn't right at the time. And, and maybe never will be, maybe never will be. Uh, I, I have more uh, psychedelic things to say about that. But um, my, my mother absolutely imparted in me a, a spirituality that, that is uh, alive in my Judaism. And, and my dad didn't have it to give like, and, and in fact, I converted my father to psychedelics at 75 and, and he's become quite spiritual, but only in his latter seventies, did he have anything that uh, like approximated some spiritual life. 
Uh, my grandmother was a, a, a very brilliant woman, a very, very powerful woman. And my, my paternal grandmother, she lived to be 103, I think. Wow. And uh, was, you know, she wrote a book called Torah for Today. She was very active in the synagogue. But I don't think that she really had the, the parake, the why in it all. I think it was, it was largely community-based and, and, and that's so important, but it's a different part. It's a, diff it's a different piece than to feel connected to, to source energy, which, which my mother had. And, and she passed it on to me somehow, like it's definitely there. And, and it's been uh, a process that, that's still under process for, for me to, to merge that with, with my Judaism and, and in, in the claiming of the Judaism that is mine. Yeah. Well, the story that you tell, and I've heard now a, a, a few times, and I feel like I'm getting deeper and deeper into it as we continue to connect, you know, this feeling of, um, of being enough, mm -hmm. um, and which I think is such an, an important conversation to have. Uh, um, so many Jewish people, I think, uh, who are patrilineal or even, you know, converts, regardless of where they are, right, there's something still about them where they feel excluded from the larger Jewish communal vibe um, and Zach, for lots I, I of would, different reasons. I would say that that, that that piece also applies to like Jews who have a, both parents are Jews. Like I've, I've got a 74 year old male client who loves when I say Jewish enough. He's totally a hundred percent Jewish, both sides. He's like, right. that feels so good to me. I never, like, I've mm -hmm. always felt not enough in my Judaism mm -hmm. and he's very right. connected to his like, to his Judaism, not so much to religion or, or um, ha -ha, but he's like, I'm a Jew and I'm Jewish enough. And, yes. and that enoughness, I think is, is very, a, a human thing, but, mm -hmm. but something that also gets played out a lot in the space of, of Jewish practice and Jewish community and mm -hmm. who's, who counts and, and who's doing it right. And, and who's not doing it right or whatever, like, like right. how do we cast that off? Because it's right. not useful for anyone. So how do we cast it off? I mean, like we can widen this, like, you know, everyone, if everyone is learning and everyone is um, in some ways, like, still there's there's jewish enough right like i am at home in my jewish self and i have all of these books to learn and read like there's still things that i i aspire to right so we in some ways there's this framework where yeah we are jewish enough and we aren't um and that's a powerful and exciting tension but i think for whatever reason people gravitate more toward the uh, feeling of lack than the feeling of fullness and I'm wondering just through your story and the connection that you've made with so many other people that feel the same way, regardless of their background or orientation, like how do we get over that hump, right? That is, can we tell a new story about our Jewishness, who, uh, whoever we are, um, and how do we get there? And what's the psychedelic aspect of it that you said that you think like is important to um, finally getting us there or starting to get us there even? Well, Zach, we absolutely need to tell new stories. We, we need to tell new stories that are inspired and anchored by like old ones. I, I, I find my, my first psychedelic experience ever was biblical. It was literally biblical. I, I laid in my brother's arms and like had this visual of, you know, desert, animals, caravans, like taking this Herculean journey from my mind into my heart. And that, that's, that's where the enoughness lies, right? That's where, where the abundance lies. It's, it's not gonna be a cognitive thing, mm. right? Right. Now let's use our minds because our minds aren't the enemy. Like we get to partner with our minds in good ways. And, and I've had so many different experiences with psychoactive medicines that, that are just deeply, deeply, deeply Jewish and have also supported me in in the continued process of enoughness, uh, I, I, I'm not fully there yet. You know, even as I was like showering before we jumped on this uh, conversation on Zoom, I, I, I was thinking about, you know, cause we, we had spoken into like, am I gonna tell this part of my story? And this is the first time I've ever like said it publicly. And, and there's a part of me that, that's still very tender and very like, you know, can get triggered in it. And, and the trigger is the teacher. 
it's 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 the it's the kind of okay this is the direction like you, you need to go you need to keep going in that direction and you know for me when i'm when i'm specifically with ayahuasca i have a lot of jewish content come up a lot and i can't control where my psyche goes or where my spirit goes i can't like i wish i could maybe sometimes but but I, that this is what it is. Like, this is mine. This is my lineage. This is my history. And, and there's just so much uh, um, beauty and breakdown. There's so much that's like, excruciating and so much that's exquisite. And, and I have been able to really dance with both in these spaces and places. And then of course, the, the, the name of the game as a, as a clinician and, and as a person that likes to work with the plants and work with the compounds is for it to be generative in, in this field without medicine, right? I don't, I don't trip every day. I sit and I meditate every day and I talk to people every day. And, and how, do, how do I sit in my, in my worthiness, in my, in my being with you, hmm. not needing to be above you or below you, and, and below you is where I've, I've liked to, to be. That's where I've, I've tended to go. Like, how do I just sit with you? And, and my experiences have been so supportive with that. Um, you know, and I, I study Jewish mysticism uh, regularly with, with uh, my, my rabbi who is my friend. He's, he's, he's truly my friend. And, and we have developed a friendship that, that has reciprocity. And I think in, for a lot of people who sit in a role of rabbi or teacher, it, the reciprocity isn't always there, right? There's a lot of giving, giving, giving. And to be in a place of, of uh, equal exchange is, is so juicy. And, and in that also is, is the opportunity to really see and be seen. And that's a miracle. To see and be seen is a miracle. So I have the privilege of being in an in intimate friendship with my rabbi who has uh, uh, universes of Jewish wisdom coursing through his veins for eons, like both sides, like deep, deep, deep study. And his transmission of, of Jewish wisdom is so alive and resonant and, and important for modern living. And, and I have spent a lot of times, as I mentioned, you know, I had like a seven year relationship with a man where I was, you know, th th so much of the context of the relationship was you're not enough. And, and you know, you're pregnant, you're pregnant with a Jewish soul and, and, and you're not, you're not there yet. Right. Um, you could be, you could be, but you got to do all these things first and that, that whole thing. So I, it's. Can I break down something that I just yeah, heard from you? Break it down. Yeah. So what I heard from you, that the question that I asked was, how do we start to move past this, regardless of our Jewish orientation? What's the psychedelic element that can help us get there? And I heard at least four things. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote them down. One is what I would call uh, proud ownership of tradition, lineage, and ancestry. The second is some sort of embodied transpersonal experience of our myths. And you know, we talked about this also earlier with our good friend Ido Cohen, like how do we actually do that? Um, and the third is, I think you brought it up with regard to your rabbi, but I think broadly reciprocity, right? Not just like what can Judaism offer me um, but what are my talents, my gifts that I can offer, not just my community, but you know, my, my entire lineage? What can I add to the conversation? What can I add to the story um, that is mine? Um, that, that requires a lot, I think, of like self-love, self-worthiness, and um, <clears throat> feeling like you have something worthwhile to give, which of course you do. And then fourth, connected to the third one, this very fundamental relationship uh, of a teacher and a student where there's also deep friendship and compassion uh, and openness. So that's at least four things. If we're, if we're building a recipe um, for healing Jewish wounding uh, um, of modern identity and the conflicts and challenges, that's at least four. I've, I've, um, I've, I've got a little more for you based on Yeah, hit me, hit me. So I try to vector my attention towards the light all the time. And if I can hold and see the light, then I can be in the dark for a long time. And 
within the space of medicine work and like deep, deep medicine work, sometimes it's really hard and, and, and it's savage sometimes. And it's, as I mentioned, ayahuasca is kind of my, 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 my favorite and, and ayahuasca is a lot. And, and what ayahuasca for me is, is, is life. It's like, right? Like, wow. And as it turns out, life is a lot. And can you hold it? Like, can you sit in your life force and source? Can you, can you be with what is? Now, I have had multiple journeys with ayahuasca where I have Holocaust visuals come up. And, you know, just to like bear witness. I have also, in, you know, when I'm in the jungle drinking medicine, I, I, I turn my phone off for the week. And I, and I make one exception to call, guess who, dot, 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 my rabbi. And, and I say, like, talk to her to me, like, you know, break it down. Tell me what we're, what we're working with this week. Like, how, how do I infuse this wisdom into my own life? And as I mentioned, he has an extraordinary ability to, to make the teachings relevant and resonant to, to now. And, the, and, and that's where we are. We're here. Aksha, po, now. And he he's also talked with me a lot about Rabbi Akiva. And how Akiva's teacher like taught him like, and this too is good, and this too is good, and this too is good. Now that not in a way that's bypassy, but like how do we work with the pain so that we can transmute it into purpose? Mm. How do how do we be in this in in the kind of light while we're in the dark? Mm. And I had and have like kind of walked with Akiva through these mystical gardens. And it's said that you know, when he went into the mystical gardens, he went with a few others. One became a nihilist, one died, one went crazy. He, he came and left in peace, right? So there's a context with which we should walk the mystical gardens. And, and the mystical gardens are absolutely you know, opening up in, in wild ways when we drink medicine, but the mystical garden is life. Mm. And, 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 and it is all unknown in every moment and can change in, in unimaginable ways. And I, I know, in, in a more recent journey, which was really supportive for me in being able to have this public conversation where I can speak to like, you know, my issues and challenges with belonging and with my lineage. I had, I went walking with Akiva with peace and, and I just saw the magic also of Shabbat. And it was Shabbat when I was you know, drinking this medicine. And, and I was like, Shabbat is the coolest thing ever. Like, thank you, Abraham Heschel, for your like brilliant words, like to really like e explain how magical this thing is and, and how generative it is, period. Like everybody needs a timeout, a, like a weekly TO for a weekly wellness ritual where we just gather together to sing, to eat, to love, to have meaningful conversations and to rest. And so I was like, just like seeing Shabbat is like, ah, cool. And also seeing the centrality of family and community, right? Like, like good, right relations. And, and so I think also part of the, the shifting of the story that we each might individually carry that can be challenging or that we carry as, as a, a collective in, in the Jewish world is in like anchoring, tethering to what it is that you actually care about here. Like what, what about these traditions have resonance and aliveness for you, what, what supports you in your navigation of the mystical garden of your own life experience? And, and, and how do we bring like God into that? You know, one of my favorite things about Judaism is that it's not about abdication or asceticism. I think so much of spirituality is about being in form, having these vessels, like the vessel of our physicality, the vessel of the homes that we create. And you know, Judaism asks us to beautify, like the experience of beauty matters. Right, we, we're so overly obsessed with beauty in this culture that it's become a bit toxic. But the experience of it is different, and 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 important. <laughs> how do we set our table? How how do we how do we like t talk to each other? And you know, Jewish mysticism also says that thought is clothing. Like, let's dress beautifully, and dress beautifully, right? Like, and play with your avatar. I mean, that, that, this is Judaism. It's, it's about elevation and celebration of the physical because it's a, a freaking miracle that any of us exist at all. Like it, it's mathematically impossible that any one of us are here in a body and we are. 
Cool. So you've added um, more spice, more salt, more sweetness to the mix. I'm using. <laughs> I'm going with the. I'm going with the recipe metaphor because um, it feels apt. And again, I'm just struck by not only just like the way that you have entered into uh, your own modern mystical uh, school of yourself and for others this mystery school. Um, but it, just from what I'm hearing, it, it actually feels quite demanding mm. that this is not light work. This is not like a quick fix of a Jewish engagement model or, you know, a Jewish institutional framework um, where we want people to feel better about their Jewishness. And so we, you know, we, Hold them as they are. Everything is fine. Don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna just love you the way that you are. It, it sounds like you want people that are interested on this path to actually bring in and do quite a bit. And so, like, where does that where does that lie for most people who you share this this orientation toward vectoring light and anchoring and leaving room for spirit? Um, making things relevant and resonant so then being open to teaching like how do, how do, do people just like because of medicine or because of you um are open to that or do you still feel like any like resistance like where is the where are the like push and pull points between all these things like personally with the community that you work with and the jews that you encounter spirituality is a personal exercise mm. it's it's a very personal <clears throat> exercise and I am a therapist and an educator yeah. and to be a teacher I am first a student I, I I'm starting my my training tomorrow I, I have 24 clinicians coming together that I'm going to teach and support in, in experiences for a week and you know I think it's a weird world where the need for therapy is so high. Once upon an acid trip with my dad, I was like, what a weird job I have. Like weird that people have to pay to be heard and seen and helped and loved, right? Like love is really the medicine. And, you know, if, if the job that I have wasn't as needed, I would just want to talk about God. Because at this point, the way that I look at it, like I, I joke that, that atheists lack intellectual rigor and curiosity. And I've had experiences with, with medicine specifically and then outside of medicine where, you know, a, a nanosecond in those spaces will, would convert anyone to God. And, and I don't care <clears throat> what you call God. I am comfortable with that word. Mm -hmm. Spirit, whatever, universe. It, it, there's something out there. And it, and, and it is a personal exercise. Like there's, there's um, what I've learned through my study is that all of the different kind of commandments, th they have good reason. Like there, there's something that's actually quite meaningful and beautiful about, about them. And, and the practice like should only be done to the extent that it really makes sense for a person, that it really has resonance. Like otherwise you're just compliant and obedient. And like that, that's less interesting. I think, I think that, you know, to be really spiritually connected, it involves some degree of spiritual rebellion, right? Like what, what am I doing? Who am I? And, and those are questions that a person gets to be in within the space of, of self mm -hmm. and as self meets like the rest of what is right. Like I, I've been in the study of Modani, the prayer that we're meant to say when we open our eyes. And Modet, thank you, surrender. Like before you even say I, before the, you become anything, but it's about that relationship between self and all that exists and acknowledging and being acknowledged by that. And is there the difficulty? Yeah, for sure. But, you know, th without, there's no consonance and harmony without some degree of dissonance. And, and there, Judaism is a big ask. And, and I think, you know, my experience is that when, when people are in deeper levels of practice, uh, it, it, there's deeper levels, right, to, to go. Let me um, make just one observation, and this is, again, based on the previous conversation, like talking about the, the, the demand or the command, um, the, the rigor of the practice. Um, 
but that also I think your orientation and I, th I think for many people and your rabbi included is that this is not all or nothing and that there's a lot of fear that if I step into this tradition that I have to go with the all and that I'm not ready for that and so I'll take the nothing because the all is too daunting and I know so for yourself you are a soul for, soulful person you are an observant person right I would call you observant um and yet that. there are yeah, well, how could you not be, how, how could we, <laughs> I would call you a religious person, of course. Um, I'm like flattered. You might not, like, you might not like, identify that way, but of course, like, I mean, I see it coursing through you. It's everything that we talk about always. Um, anyone who knows you knows that you're such a from Jew. Um, and yet there are aspects of religious life that you're, you don't necessarily observe or you observe in your own way. And it comes to like, the enoughness and the aspiration for something like I don't know what your kashrut practices or how much tzedakah you give or you know if you recycle your styrofoam you know like whatever it is um but there uh, still like is there like a creative tension there being like I am enough I'm doing all I'm I'm so it's coursing through my veins it is my life it's my container and I'm not going this whole way because I either I don't need to you said something about it doesn't make sense to you and so I can't bring it on like what is that is there a tension there or is that just like easy and flowing what how is that I, I think the today? answer to that, I think the answer to that is it depends on who I'm around hmm. and and sort of a projection of what other people want me to be or what I think I should be and, and so th there's like an ego conversation that comes online. And I mean, there, there's a part of me, as I mentioned, like Shabbat is just like the coolest thing. I don't think there's anything cooler than Shabbat. I don't. I, I'm very observant. Maybe Yom Kippur. But anyway. <laughs> Yom Kippur is a really cool one too. It's really cool. I'm super <laughs> down. Um, I, I, I love making amends. It's such a, I mean, like how cool is Judaism? Very, very cool. It's very cool. <laughs> Honestly, I'm like, what? So most of the time, well, at its essence, at its hmm. essence, like Jewish practice and people are different from Judaism. I, you're telling, I, I know I tried to tell people this, of course, but right, right, right. So I, I think it depends on like, like the company that I'm around. Uh, and, and that's a, a very human kind of piece of me, like, again, wanting to fit in and wanting to please and ultimately I I'm really good with where I'm at and there's a way in which I would like to you know probably turn my phone off for a day that seems really like a great idea I don't have guilt or shame that I'm not there yet um but but th there are times when I effort more to be um really present and and less connected to through technology that, that that's an edgy one for me but but i think to answer your question it's it's more about the community hmm. Hmm. and i'm typically the person zach that's like igniting judaism and others who have let it be dormant in them uh for reasons probably like you just named where where it's it's not been attractive it's not been comforting it's not been beautiful uh it's been laden with rules and the rules that don't make sense and judgment and like no thank you certainly that was my father I mean I, I I'm in the place of I'm like dad I introduce you to drugs late in life like they're really cool trust me Judaism's a vibe also and and he's you know has a little bit more resistance to it but is deeply identified as a Jewish man and and I've been in the space of you know, wanting to give him a little bit more of where he comes from in a way that can be resonant and a way that can be supportive. And so, I mean, perfect example. So someone that you're obviously deeply connected to, right? You have a, a powerful relationship, someone who came from a non-observant background. You told me the story of his family and um, how they came to this country. Uh, of course, like on Instagram, seeing your dad put on tefillin for the first time since his bar mitzvah is like a very, you know, it's like, not only is it very beautiful on its own, but then it becomes very public. And 
it in some ways it's like the way that you're telling your story and your family's story is that you are repairing this kind of I don't maybe don't even call it a kink but just like there's something in the lineage that broke down for really good reasons yeah really really good reasons and there is power nevertheless in our traditions and in our rituals and our technology that we can continue to play with even if we don't feel completely comfortable with them like your dad's not putting on tefillin every day right that's like the brilliance of chabad it's like do one mitzvah today um see what it's like just now but I, i'm wondering you know what is your is your dad for example um he, is he, he's okay where he is there's no need for him to change anything so when you have these deep, powerful conversations about his Jewishness, like what is his vector? He just, you know, it's something that he's grateful for you for bringing in, but also, you know, at this stage in his life, like he's had, he's had his fill and when it gets sprinkled in, it's good. Or how much, how much can you actually ignite for someone who thinks like they're fine the way that they are? Well, it's it's absolutely not my job to ignite anything in him. And there's, a, 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 I, there's, you know, a, I do have an agenda with him yeah, at times because I, hmm. I have been so enamored with Jewish wisdom and, and my father's so deeply, deeply identified as a Jew. And he likes right. Jewish people more than non-Jewish people. Like when he first meets them, you know, he's, he's like, I feel safe with them, you know, he's got a whole yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, dad, like you realize that like the Jewish people are extraordinary and like what, like, and also mathematically impossible mm. and what's kept the Jews Judaism. Like, let's check it out. Like you like the Jews, like check out your thing. Like, and, and so th there, there's a part in me that just wants him to see how, how special it is and how, how relevant it is and how comforting it could be. And, you know, he grew up going to an Orthodox synagogue, um, but also very deeply disconnected from any, any meaning there. Like, it's like people were not seemingly good people. Like they were just not doing what, what felt godly. And it was a real turnoff to him. And, and he's like, no one told me how special this was. I mean, he's like, I, I just had to do it. You know, I had to, I had to go and go learn and do this stuff. And I didn't want to do it. It sucked, you know? And so I, he, he's, he's, he is exactly where he's supposed to be. And he, he is in the space of allowing me to share with him. And, and, and that's, that's enough. Um, because for me, so like, maybe, I, oh, go I, ahead, I'm going to be learning Judaism. I, I mean, for the rest of my life. So if you maybe had like one hope for whatever this thing is, psychedelic Judaism that we're all playing with in our own worlds and we're coming together and starting to make things, um, what would be like one grand hope that you would have for uh, this movement, this lineage, this tradition that's starting to churn all of these wonderful ideas and hybrids and um, and and cross cross pollinations mm -hmm. in in many ways I, I see us living in, in a post-religious world in in a world where where we are totally bereft of of structure and ritual for how to navigate the mystical gardens mm. we we need structure and ritual we, we we like need it and i would i i'm, I'm in a prayer that people can be in the space of of reclamation of recreation and and of connecting in in a, in good ways to where they come from because you know there's so much conversation Zach around intergenerational trauma but we also have wild intergenerational resilience and blessings and so how do we kind of clean up the shit because there's a lot of it so that we can like hug and hold all the all that's good and all that's beautiful and all that will allow us to 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 walk the world in 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 more uh, reverence and respect and care for ourselves and each other. I mean, 
Judaism, my rabbi translates it to mean just thank you. Hmm. And, you know, I once upon an ayahuasca trip, like I saw my tombstone and it read, thank you. Hmm. Like, thank you. I'm, I am so grateful to be here at all. Yeah. And, I, and I want for others to feel their aliveness, to feel their connection with life force and with source, because it's here now, always. And, and in ways that, that we've been practicing for a long time and in ways that have worked and in ways that have like birthed so much meaning and love and family and home and song and dance and yes, and bless like that. That's, that's really my prayer. Mm. I'll, uh, I'll add on to your prayer a little bit, just to, uh, just as your rabbi said that uh, Judaism, Yahadut, is uh, so much about the Hoda'a, about the Modeh, um, the gratitude, the awareness, thankful awareness, um, that also that Yisrael, the Israel, um, so often translated as like struggling with divinity from the story about our ancestor Yaakov and uh, the divine being. Uh, and also just to let in the quality of Yashar El, right? That this is a straight path to divinity as well. Mm -hmm. um, that it's a direct path. Uh, and so, you know, either choosing one or the other, people who decide to continue to struggle and continue to go straight to God, and also the dance between them, right? That's something that I want to continue to bring in is the, the, the dialogy, right? The, the both and. Um, and how they continue to play. Thank you, Lauren, for everything and always. And uh, have the opportunity now to uh, answer some questions or some or some reflections from the people who have been listening to us as well. So I want to um, say one more thing, Zach, and then very happy. Go for it. Go for it. Thing. You know, I, I've had conversations with with my rabbi about you know people off the derech, like this kind of expression of being off the path of of, of practice and not doing mm. the thing right. La la la. He's like, as long as you're walking, you're on the path. Mm. So I think that's part of how we kind of manage the enoughness, right? Like if you're walking, you're you're, you're doing it. Thank you for being on the path with me, <laughs> and uh, with so many others. And if there are other questions or ideas that uh, are present for people who are currently on this recording. I'd love to open up the space for that. I have a quick question. Well, I don't know if it's quick, but I have a question. <laughs> um, What's your think, name? Hi. My name is Mary or my Russian name is Masha. So either one, Mary. Hi, Masha. Hi. Hi, Lauren. Thank you so much for everything you share. There's so much resonance I can't even explain. And thank you, Rabbi, too, for hosting this. Um, my question is kind of just, I guess, I don't know if you've ever dealt with this, but I deal a lot with just projections from my family who I was, you know, raised Jewish, born Jewish, but I went away from my family for a good five, six years and found my spirituality in addition to my Judaism, also discovered psychedelics. And now I'm back in New Jersey living with my family um, who has changed drastically, dramatically over the last couple of years. Now, you know, observes Shabbat, ob observes all the high holy holidays, but now I struggle a lot with their projections on my spirituality versus, you know, Judaism is to them is I guess kind of like linear and you know by the Torah and by these laws and if you don't do these laws and you're essentially sinning and you know long story short I'm really struggling right now being back in this environment and kind of marrying the two together my Judaism and my spirituality much like how you were talking about so kind of just asking for advice on how to deal with those kind of projections because I resonate a lot with you know your story and how you came to the Judaism and and you know, marry this spirituality to it. So I'm kind of just on that same exact journey, so to speak. So just kind of looking for some advice on how to approach that while I'm living with them again. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you, Masha. I, I think I, I have thoughts, and Zach, I'm sure you have thoughts too. Do I, I'm, I'll, okay, great. Uh, thank you. And and I think that I, I've spoken a bit about like the the, the pressures from others 
as creating so much of the, the challenge. And, you know, my dad says to me, he's, he's proud of me for going in the direction of my own direction. And I offer that as, as like a, for all of us to, to be going in the direction of our own direction, to be authentic, to be who you are, to be in your own truth is, is, is liberating. And, and, and there's, they might not like it or get it. And, and, and can you be okay with them not liking it or getting it and like having their judgment and, and loving yourself as you are, right? Like loving your truth and it, there's dissonance, right? There, there's going to be dissonance. There's going to be challenges. And, and I would also invite like looking at maybe what scares them mm-hmm. to, to birth some compassion, right? Like they're, they're probably in constriction there, there's fear and judgment. Like that doesn't feel good for anybody. Uh, the ones who carry it and the ones that they're putting it on. But so how do you kind of like, like take that off? Uh, I I imagine it would be very difficult being that you're in the home with them. And and so that, that is going to add like fire and, and, and you get to kind of keep standing up tall in in what's true for you and, uh, and not getting shackled by, by them. And, and I, I bless kind of like your own knowing Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to bring in the uh, the time that we're in, right? Such a powerful, potent ballast for uh, inspiration. Um, we're in the eleventh day of the Omer, the period between Passover and Shavuot, um, and so we have all of these qualities um, that we get to work with, and the and the combinations of divine qualities or essences as we go. And today, as the 11th day of the Omer, is called Netzach of Gevura, right? That we're in this week of thinking about constriction and boundaries and strength. And um, and sometimes, you know, that there's the shadow side of that as well. Um, but today, the Netzach is the perseverance uh, of boundaries, right? How long can we keep that boundary um, and what do we need to do to uh, resource ourselves in order to maintain that, right? There are things that are outside of that relationship that we have to continue to feed ourselves so that when we come back into a relationship that has a very clear and strict boundary, that we don't feel like we've completely burned out from that. So I want to bless you with, just in one sentence, this amazing resource from my friend, Rabbi uh, Gabriel Goldfeder. Sometimes we have to exert force in order to maintain space and restraint. So if you could identify those internal and external factors that are pushing you to step over that boundary, setting your mind toward counteracting that urge. Um, and, uh, you know, other than the boundary, is there a point of connection in your spirituality and practice and theirs that can have a lot of love and a lot of life, Mm -hmm. right? It's, um, there are these moments where we can just find, right? The the one book, the one sentence, the one mitzvah that we both share in common that we have deep, deep feelings about. Um, Mm -hmm. And could we just maybe just put all of our loving attention there? Um, and see what grows from there in that mystical garden. Mm-hmm. Masha, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. I like to say too that what we don't express, we suppress, repress, and depress, and it shows up as disease and dis-ease of all kinds. So I think yes to finding points of connection that that are are good, and simultaneously, like you can let your your voice be heard, like this is where I'm at. Like I, 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 we have differences and like, I'd like you to respect me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Asking for what we need. Mm -hmm. Expecting that we, that our expectations will be honored. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Others, please, if there are. Um, I have a question. Um, hi, I'm, my name is Mike, um, th- and you could both answer this. Uh, first of all, thank you both. This has been super interesting and a great conversation. 
Um, this might be a more basic question, so I apologize if it is, but um, in, and it's more kind of purely psychedelic, but um, in psychedelic experiences, there's so much content which is not explicitly Jewish, you know, which is, you know, all the filters are off and it's non-denominational to say the least, you know, like, um, so can you talk a little bit about how you apply your uh, Jewish wisdom to, is it interpretive of those experiences? Is it something you're uh, applying afterwards? Can you just talk to me a little bit about like how you're using Judaism in a way as a tool to uh, both in interpret, dissect, and live out the content of these experiences? Thanks, Mike. So when, when Jewish content presents for me, that's when I work with it. Otherwise, I'm just working with my human. Like, I don't, I don't need to push my human in, into something ever. Um, and, you know, I, I want to be fully alive. And, and, I, and I do like to, to dial up, like, spiritual frequency, which, as, you know, Masha just said, like, there's, there's sometimes difference between religion and spirituality. And, and those two have a great amount of space for intersectionality. But, you know, even in recipro the reciprocal conversations that I'm having with my rabbi, like, th they're not all conversations about Judaism. It's like conversations about life and, 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 and they're, they're in a dance, but they're not always the same. And ultimately the experiences that I have with medicine, my, my hope is that they translate into more aliveness, more connection, uh, more spirituality and, uh, and more resonance with what's real for me at the time. And what I hear in your, uh, question Mike a little bit is when there's content that isn't explicitly Jewish or potentially is comes from other traditions um how do how do we work with that um you know the idea of uh like a, a modern orthodox Jewish person in medicine space who has a vision of uh Jesus speaking to them or on the cross and the you know uh feeling the crucifixion and the resurrection, for example, like, whoa, whoa, what do I, you know, what do I do with that? What does that mean? Does that mean that this is real? Does this mean that I'm now a Christian? This is a conversion experience. Um, you know, our, like Lauren is saying, like our, our receptors are, um, are up and high and we're absorbing things. I'm personally would call myself a psychedelic constructivist um, that because I'm, absorbing so much cultural material of course it's going to be in there um <clears throat> and sometimes there are things that are so overwhelmingly true um that i can't avoid them and have to follow them um but you know, there's no one size fits all here but um when i have talked and supported so many people through the work with shefa um that it's it becomes a choice after sometimes it it's it's non-negotiable during the experience, but so much is after the fact of, of the meaning making um, that I that I that I apply to this. And I have not yet encountered, although I'm sure there are people who encounter other cultural, religious, spiritual material than their lineage that then say, I I, I have to be a Hindu now. I must be Hindu because of this. Or uh, you know, I, but I have encountered people, religious people specifically, who because of their experiences and the other way, but just to bring it here, people who are observant, who say, I cannot observe mitzvot anymore. I cannot be an observant person. Um, I've seen, felt, heard something in my experience that where I have to start walking away from this. But my sense is, is that that was always there, but was a kernel, it was a seed, it was a husk, it was an it was a whisper or a shadow, where because of those filters being removed, it was just given time to actually express itself. And that sometimes people just, you know, uh, immediately just cast all of the the garbs off. They were all of the veils are off and I'm no longer observant anymore. But I really encourage people to slowly like Start to just like feel into, is this true? How much of this is true? If I decided to walk the, 
down this path of non-observance, for example, how much of my life would change that I feel comfortable with, right? There are all these relationships. Um, and to go slow by walking down the path. Um, but there is a lot possible. And I think having a teacher, student, friend relationship with someone who can be with others in this process, encouraging my personal orientation, going slow with what has come through. Um, that seems to be uh, that seems to be uh, meaningful and effective for a lot of people. Lauren, you have anything else to uh, say on this? I, I think I was in the amen, amen, amen to what you were sharing. You know, there, there's, uh, I, I'm feeling into also some of my mom's wisdom around, you know, understanding God is bigger than any story of him, her, it, they, them. And, mm -hmm. you know, when, when something does present like, yes, going slowly, like treading lightly. And, um, and also it, it, it as Zach said, it, it was probably already there. Yeah, for another time, absolutely, the power of other people's myths um, mm -hmm. and what we choose to let in and the things that we can't choose to let in. Um, you know, I, I've often felt like how powerful the idea of, of dying and being reborn mm -hmm. in God's body. Like, that's, that's something that, you know, like many, many people experience. Um, often daily uh and what would it be like to to actually encounter something like that uh, would that make me a christian or would that just make me a more interesting jew <laughs> um well we have to wrap up our conversation for today but this has been so wonderful to speak with lauren and to others um again you can always uh, find lauren on social media and on her website and we'll provide those links um, also just in the, uh, in the show notes. Again, thank you for being part of this conversation. You can always go back to www.shefaflow.org to find out more conversations that we're having, more programming around the preparation and integration of Jewish psychedelic experiences and finding out what is psychedelic Torah in this moment. Uh, and I look forward, Lauren, to more conversations and, and more experiences together. We have yet to meet in person, but I, I know that it's coming soon. It is. I can't wait. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you again, Shavuotov, and uh, we'll see you soon.